Song of Myself marathons. And pretty soon you will be able to view both of those marathons on our YouTube channel, as well as our website, uh, waltwhitmaninitiative.org. Um, September 19th, this year, we had our first live marathon since 2019. We were so happy to be back in Brooklyn Bridge Park. Uh, we have lots of people to thank for pulling that together, none the least of which is the Brooklyn Bridge Park Conservancy. They loan us that space every year with a spectacular view of the sunset over Manhattan and uh, the uh, speaker system and the seating and everything. So we're really grateful to them, but also to all of you that came out and either read or clapped or otherwise participated. Thank you. We have an amazing documentary of that event by our board member, D. Kui, and we have been privileged to see it, but it's not on the loose just yet. So please tune in for that, especially if you were a reader. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful tribute to the many voices that bring Whitman to life every year. And as you know, already up on our website is the recorded Song of Myself Marathon, which has become a global event. And we did that this year in June. That is in itself a trip, right? Because that's the entire poem. So if you're studying Song of Myself or Whitman and you want to hear inspired voices, again, bringing this poet to life, please do visit our website or our YouTube channel. Uh, the other thing we're super, super proud of, and there are, again, a lot of people involved in this, is that we opened the first truly dedicated poetry library in New York City. It's called the Walt Whitman Initiative Susan Tain Poetry Library, and it's down at 91 South Street at South Street Seaport. Uh, I was just there yesterday because we have incredible interns, Marcella and Gila, both students at uh, Yeshiva University, who are cataloging our hundreds and hundreds of books that we receive by donation. Um, we are only possible because of Andrew Rimby, who is a board member of the Whitman Initiative and is the curator and librarian of that particular uh, initiative of ours which is probably in, you know, besides the Song of Myself Marathon and this series, one of our top, top things that we are doing. Um, we're very proud to offer the city this free access poetry library. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to pay. You can just come. Fulton Stall Markets downstairs, Bob Lewis and Stephen Dima who run that remarkable uh, farmers co food co-op, uh, Manhattan Farmers Food Co-op that gets fresh produce from uh, New York City and beyond. They have sponsored us and have voluntarily donated a library space for us. And we have chairs and we have a view of the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, all of these things just for you. And you can read Whitman and Melville and all sorts of other stuff at your leisure. So please visit our website to learn more about that. And we want to thank a number of people because we had the library opening on September 30th. And we had performances by Tim Cusack, who's a dear friend, uh, uh, Paula Janine Bennett, who was spectacular reciting uh, Crossing Brooklyn Ferry. Campania de Columbari, the director of that, uh, Karin Kunrod came down and did a reading. Lots of people contributed. Thank you so much, everybody, for bringing that event to life. And we do have a documentary of that poetry library opening, which will be up on our website as soon as we can find volunteers to put it up there. Uh, so, so do stay tuned. Um, we're very proud of a lot of partnerships this year, the Brooklyn Book Festival, again, Campania de Columbari. Uh, we even had some overseas events at uh, in London and in Bolton, England, uh, in London at Conway Hall. And in Bolton, we, we had a major event at Bol the University of Bolton and the Bolton Museum. Um, so thank you, everyone overseas and beyond for such a great, great year. And just one thing to look out for, especially if you're in New York City, this Wednesday at the Grolier Club, which is at 47 East 60th Street on the Upper East Side of New York City, we are having a spectacular event to honor 
our supporter and benefactor, Susan Tain. And it's hosted by the American Trust for the British Library. And in fact, if you go to the American Trust for the British Library site, you can see a point of entry for buying tickets for this event. Again, December 7th, Wednesday, next week, 6 to 8.30 p.m. Uh, Susan is donating a extremely rare copy of the so-called English issue of the first edition of Leaves of Grass to the British Library. Um, as many of you know, I just spent a year in London and the UK does not have a, a remarkable collection of wit mania. Um, there are very few holdings, in fact, even at places like the, the British Library or at Oxford's uh, library. Um, it's, it's actually quite remarkable. So Susan giving this gift of a first edition of Leaves of Grass, which is priceless in many ways, um, I think <clears throat> will change the face of Whitman scholarship, maybe in the UK, and also possibly alert the British public to the presence of Whitman, uh, very much so in the 19th century and early 20th century. So on next Wednesday, it's your last chance to see the book before it leaves for the UK. And I've organized a, a small exhibition about Whitman's um, reception and uh, reputation in the UK, which I will happily uh, introduce and walk people through as part of the event. So would love to meet you. And if you are a fan of Whitman, we would love to, to see you and to toast. There will be food and drink and the Grolier is absolutely beautiful. So I hope you really consider joining us. And I wanna thank Elizabeth Berkowitz, who's the executive director of the American Trust for the British Library for enabling that event. Uh, by the way, in the British Library in February, when they have the book, there will be an event honoring the arrival of that so-called English issue of Leaves of Grass. So February 15th, I think it will also be on Zoom and I will be part of that. So something else to look forward to. Okay, guys, well, speaking of beautiful New York spaces like the, the uh, Grolier Club, a few weeks ago, I found myself in Carnegie Hall for the first time since the pandemic. And I was just so thrilled to be back in that incredible space but also <clears throat> really thrilled, and sorry, everyone, I have, I'm working on a, a cold here. Also really thrilled to be there for a concert uh, involving two absolutely magnificent works. One of them was called A Nation of Others, which is an American historical oratorio with music by Paul Moravec and a libretto by Mark Campbell. And the other work was called Whitman's America, which is a setting of six of Whitman's poems by Rob Patterson. That name might be familiar to you all because we just interviewed Rob Patterson earlier this year. So if you're on your computer right now, you can take a look at that. Please do revisit uh, that remarkable um, interview. And you know, I wanted to congratulate Rob because it was just amazing to hear the entire piece live in such a remarkable space. But we are here to talk about Paul's work. And uh, Paul is here. He is uh, a friend in addition to an unbelievable, one of the great artists of our time. And before I even introduce him, I wanted to do something really sneaky and show you all photos of the event. So I'm not sure I could legally do this. No, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> but I did it anyway. Uh, and we had some pretty good seats up in the balcony. And uh, for those of you that have never had the luxury of sitting in Carnegie Hall, one of the great places to hear music acoustically and, and aesthetically, this is what the stage looked like. Uh, an almost sold out show, the audience was packed. It was a standing ovation. And what you are looking at, and maybe I can zoom in a little. Yes, there we go is the, the applause after the concert. And that is Paul in the dark blue suit with Mark Campbell, the librettist on the right. Uh, 
obviously getting along really well. And we will talk to Paul about that. And then all of the singers and this incredible chorus behind them. So the stage was absolutely filled. Uh, I think I have a few others. So here's a, a closer image and you can really see the camaraderie. Whitman would love it between Paul and uh, Mark right there and the musicians too applauding. And despite the masks, really you, you detect the incredibly positive energy that was there. Um, and also, uh, though I can't bring this to you because there is not an available recording, um, the spectacular show that we were able to see. So again, this was, Paul, it was, right? A premiere of A Nation yes. of Others. Right, yes. Um, very honored to be there. Only wish that we could bring you the music but at the very least, I can bring you Paul. So Paul, welcome to Robust American Love. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Glad to be here. This is great, yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's see, I will I guess I'll just offer a bit of an introduction to Paul and then maybe dive into speaking with him about his music and you know what brought him to to this career and you know he's very well informed by literature and history especially american literature and history he brings a lot of that energy to his work which which makes it very exciting uh for the audience here paul won the pulitzer prize for music in 2004 he's composed i think it's over 200 orchestral chamber lyric and operatic work so a lot of music that involves the human voice hence the title of our show today, uh, which is, gosh, did I forget what it is called? What did we call it again? Um, Hearing American Voices with Paul. Listening to America. <laughs> Listening, yes, exactly. Which kind of tied in because I think we called the one with um, Rob, uh, I Hear America Singing a Musical Conversation. So we've been really lucky lately talking to these major talents who have really seriously investigated Whitman's poetry and brought it uh, to music. Uh, a bit more about Paul, um, another piece that you all out there should look up and pay attention to is Sanctuary Road, which is actually an opera based on underground railroad narratives. And of course, we'll talk to Paul about this. Uh, and um, Sanctuary Road, uh, oh, sorry, I just mentioned that. And a new country, sorry about that, which I, I can actually play excerpts from, which is a, a, a setting of a number of different poets, but notably Walt Whitman. Uh, so we will take a look at that. Um, but Paul, you've got such a pedigree. Um, and I know we have it listed on our website, so people can look at that too. You can also go to Paul's website, paulmoravec.com. Uh, subitomusic.com is where his Subi music Subito. is published. <laughs> Subito, thank Subito. you. Yeah, that's right. Okay, very good. And I can see here that you teach at Adelphi. You've got uh, a distinguished rank there of university, um, university professor, composer in residence at the American Academy in Rome before that. So, so many wonderful honors and uh, so much great music going on. Um, how are you doing, Paul? I know you're you're getting over COVID, right? But yes, I am. So if I cough, you'll know why. <laughs> okay, well, we're both sick, unfortunately. Yeah, but we're um, doing, doing fine. Thanks. So I'm really lucky because I have the program in front of me with all of the program notes to the November 15th premiere of A Nation of Others. And inside this program is the full libretto of the piece by Mark Campbell, which is such a pleasure to page through and is quite Whitmanic, I must say, Paul, in parts. Yeah. Okay. We should yeah. get Mark on the show eventually to, to sure. talk about his input with this. Yes. But I guess I wanted to start with you. I'm looking at what you wrote about a nation of, of others. And again, this is a, a grand oratorio um, uh, based on uh, uh, the experience of Ellis Island, I guess, but we'll get into the details. The, there's one part of the program notes that really caught my eye and you write, <clears throat> a nation of others 
is the story of ordinary individuals whose names would be known only to their friends, families, and descendants. In this oratorio, Mark and I intend to acknowledge and illumine the essential sanctity of human existence in its countless manifestation. It's often hiding in plain sight, but it's always present, always has been, and always will be for all of us. Here we lend this quiet reality a voice and make it audible. In the words of the immigrants at a crucial point in our music drama, quote, look on me kindly as you would another person. So I guess that's something really to hold on to that you've written an oratorio based on the sanctity of human existence. So can we use that as a starting point? Since I guess most people listening probably have not heard A Nation of Others, but just as a way to introduce them to this remarkable piece. Yeah, that's a good place to start. Um, I really have nothing to add <laughs> to what you just read. I mean, that, that about says it all. Um, well, maybe you could tell us what it is about because there is like, yeah. To me, it kind of, I know you call it a uh, an oratorio, but it reads as an opera also, right? Like it's a story. Oh, I call it an operatorio, actually. Oh, okay. Kind of portmanteau word there, I, which I did not invent, but I use it for this piece because it's what, because Mark Campbell, my brilliant librettist, um, thinks it, operatically. He's written about 30, no, about 40 opera librettos by now. He's wow. very, very prolific, very much in demand now. He's sort of America's librettist <laughs> these days. He's very much in. Anyways, he thinks uh, in uh, dramatic terms um, and the piece is as much a, a, an opera. It, it's, think of an, an oratorio as basically an unstaged music drama. So mm. think of Messiah, for example, that tells the story of Jesus, right? Uh, that's the most famous oratorio. Um, and what Handel was doing, Handel wrote both operas and oratorios, and um, he was expert at both of them. And you know, to a large extent, he, he sort of invented you know, our modern conception of what an oratorio is. Um, and it is an unstaged music drama. It's telling a story, however, you know, in what in however abstract the terms are. So if I might go back to uh, an oratorio, Sanctuary Road, mm -hmm. about Underground Railroad, which premiered in 2018, also in Carnegie Hall, also with the Oratorio Society of New York, fantastic group, Kent Tridel, a genius, <laughs> miracle worker, um, is the uh, conductor. Um, so Sanctuary Road uh, is about the Underground Railroad, and uh, that's also a kind of operatorio. And so it in its original iteration, it is unstaged, but we have also now turned it into an opera as well. So it's, um, for example, uh, Virginia Opera is going to do it next year as an opera in its opera form. It's a North Carolina Opera um, did it uh, earlier this season and so on. So it works, it, it works on both levels in both ways. Now, um, I, I think making it into an oratorio, uh, and I'm talking about a nation of others, instead yeah. of an opera, highlights the voices more and right. allows, uh, because I, I suppose the thought is that the audience will then, if it's staged as an opera, mo a lot of our attention will go to that, right? The visuals and the the performance of the of the actors and so forth. Yeah, well, but, the act, acting takes it to a whole other level and becomes this other creature altogether, you know, so, yeah. And I also think that seeing the chorus is part of the show, right? Like yeah, just right. realizing how many voices and how many people are in the chorus that sing this. I think they're about, you saw about 150 uh, singers in the, in the chorus. And then there are 12 soloists <laughs> in addition to that, you know. Um, yeah, it's a, and a huge orchestra, you know, big orchestra. Uh, the, it, and the great thing about a big chorus when you hear it, it's, it's just viscerally like 
you know, just the way it hits our central nervous system. It, it's a thrilling experience to hear that many people on stage, you know, this wall of sound coming at you. I mean, it's fantastic. And it's like the whole world is singing, you know, on stage. It's just the most amazing thing. So in that sense, it's sort of Whitman-esque, you know, and the whole world is, you know, it's democratic with a small d, you know. It's <laughs> Yeah, and I guess going back, I mean, Whitmanic, but also going back to, and I guess this is Whitmanic too, the idea of the sanctity of human existence. Right. I mean, what better way to do that than to highlight the human voice, right? right. So, um, and I, I, I guess I wanted to dig into that a little bit with you because for people who don't write music or are not so familiar with it, it seems like a really hard job to, to sort of like put to music some a concept like the sanctity of human existence. Can you get us in there? How'd you do that? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Uh, I, you know, I, I sit at the piano and I start with an idea and I, and I work up that idea. You know, it's, it's, uh, that's, it's, in you know, creating music is at once mis not mysterious at all. It's just it's hard work. You know, <laughs> it's it's there's, there's nothing very glamorous about it. It's just a lot of hard work and 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 revision. It's constant revision, uh, uh, trial and error, and so on. So, on on a certain level, creating a work of of uh, like uh, a nation of others is there's nothing mysterious about it. On the other hand, there's something very mysterious about it because I don't know. You know, here's the here's the piece. Mm -hmm. Others here, and I honestly can't remember how I did this. <laughs> it's just here it is. Amazing. And, but it's probably just as well that I have to leave it behind here. I, I, this 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 thing needs now to go off into the world on its own, and I can you know promote it and talk about it and so on as I, as I am you know today, but. It is its own entity now, and it, and I have to. It is go. it sold that way, Paul? Like, can you can you actually purchase it like that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Subido music. There it is. You can, you can see that. The I love the cover. Can you tell us more about like why you chose that photo? That looks like the Staten Island Ferry, or well, well no, actually, this, not. it's this it's is, the. This is actually taken at Ellis Island about a oh. hundred years ago, and here are people arriving, uh, and so it's exactly, you know, our our story. These are the, you know. This is what it was like. This is the story we're telling here. Um, so, and I know it's just because I've seen it, but again, people have probably not heard it. There are several uh, lines of uh, stories interwoven through right. this uh, right. oratorio, and I'm wondering, did Mark write that first, or how do you do this when when the text is so important, or were you the first one to write, or did oh, you? No. The words always come first because otherwise I, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to proceed. I have nothing to, I need something to hang on to and I need words to set and I need a story and so on. So it's up to the librettist to do that. And uh, in, in this case, what Mark did is a lot of research. First of all, he chose, uh, you know, there's this term in um, dramatic theory called uh, the unity of time and place, you know, and that's what he chose in this case. That is, he picked a particular day in 1921, very specifically, and it all happens in that one day in his mm -hmm. imagination. So what he did is, doing all of this research, he created characters based on his researches. Researches, otherwise, it's it, it's all his invention, you know. Um, and um, as opposed to Sanctuary Road, which is based, that's the one about the Underground Railroad. What we did is we took the um, writings of William Still, who uh, was known in his own time as the father of the Underground Railroad. And a lot of it comes literally from his book called The Underground Railroad, where he wrote, he, he kept a record of all of the fugitive slaves that he helped uh, uh, escape um, from the South, but also get them onto Canada. And, and I, I love that you have brought that work to more light, the William Still book. Uh, that's that in itself, like, it seems to me, and I, I'd love to hear more about how this happened. You are illuminating or bringing to life a lot of uh, 19th century, early 20th century Americana, right? Like the, the object seems to be to, to bring music to history. So right. 
the right. how did you come across the William Still book? Well, let, um, that was Mark's decision. I wanted to write an uh, an oratorio about the Underground Railroad, and it was his inspired idea to focus on William Still, that one historical figure, um, and who was based in Philadelphia. He was the 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 what what's called a conductor on the uh, Underground Railroad, and he was a pivotal figure. He helped. Yeah, somewhere between 800 and, you know, probably a thousand slaves, oh. at least. Um, including Harriet Tubman, by the way. I mean, well. you know, uh, who's <laughs> oddly, she's better known than he is, but he's getting better known now. I mean, he's, mm. um, there's, uh, last year, finally, there is a standalone, complete biography of William Still, you know, where it's not, he, he always appears somewhere in the background of other stories, you know, in, in, in involving underground. But now, finally, he's getting his, his, he's in the spotlight now, much more so. So That's, that's brilliant to hear because yeah. the talking about the brilliant, the Underground Railroad has always been difficult, just because the nature of it has right. been to hide what went on. Right. So uh, when I bring my Whitman students to Brooklyn to, for instance, the Plymouth Church of the Pilgrims, Right. And supposedly that was a big depot, as they called them, uh, right. for the Underground Railroad. A station, a there, yeah, right. Right. There's like no exact proof of it, but right. you know, there's an oral history of it, and then there's always some documentation, and that's why I guess the William Still book is such a a, a treasure. Well, he was not only a facilitator; he is active in the operation of the um, of the Underground Railroad. Um, but he was its principal chronicler. And, mm. and he's possibly unique in this regard because, because it was clandestine, because it, it was dangerous to keep records and so on, he had to do this very carefully. You know, He interviewed everybody who came through his office. And so the, the resulting manuscript is huge. It's a huge book. And you, wow. can, you can see it online. It's, you know, it's public domain, just look on, uh, you know those public access uh, websites now. You can you can read the whole thing. It's an amazing book, and he, he like a secretary, he he asked them questions. You know, he's a journalist. He asked them questions, and they told him, and he wrote down like you know in this sort of secretarial way. He kept the records, everything. Then he hid the records during uh, the Civil War because um, it, it was a dangerous document to have. Then he brought it out after the war, and then he published it and so on. But um, it was a very it was a dangerous thing for him to do. From our point of view, of course, we're glad he did it because this is how we know uh, what we know about you know this otherwise clandestine operation. So, so it's not the type. Even though it's an amazing work, the 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 book by William Still, it's not the type of book that I would readily think of as musical. So, how do you come to the idea that you want to make this into an opera? Well, that was, again, that was Mark Campbell's choice was to focus on that book and to draw on that book and, and tell the story through William Still's lens, so to speak, through his eyes and his words and the words of the actual historical figures who are in, you know, in, in the story, you know. So, so Sanctuary Road is more sort of documentary-ish than, um, than A Nation of Others, which is more, uh, a, a product of, of Mark's imagination, you know, the, the, the characters in A Nation of Others is, is, you know, more loosely based on historical figures. Sanctuary Road is, is much more historical, actually, you know, in a way. There has been a big fight to preserve a building on Duffield Place in Brooklyn. Do you know about this? Uh, it's actually called uh, Abolitionist Place now, I think, and the Whitman Initiative was part of it. Uh, we showed up at the hearing uh, because there was a uh, property owner in Brooklyn that wanted to build a high rise on that spot and knock down the building that supposedly the Treadwell family had used as an underground railroad uh, depot. Um, and the little guy won for a change. It's remarkable. So mm -hmm. the the big plans for this multi-billion dollar project 
were shifted and this little building survives now on Duffield Place. So right. it feels to me like the perfect thing when we get round to celebrating that to haul out Sanctuary Road. It's it, right. it seems to be written for such an occasion. Um, but I guess just like as a as a as a as a scholar of 19th century literature and culture, I myself find myself really moved by your choices. And I know you're giving Mark a lot of room here because he's right. the one who sort of comes up with the concepts, but right. you're still the guy who is really thinking about the sound. And yeah. you've got, you know, especially when it comes to Whitmanic themes, because as you know, Whitman was the most set American poet of the 19th century. He might be the most set po poet of all time uh, yeah. for, for my mind, because it feels like every time I turn around, someone else is concocting a Whitmanic or Whitman-based uh, project. Yeah, and I, I know, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, please. Sorry. I wouldn't be surprised. Yes, that probably sounds true, yeah. And I know you have done that too. I mean, so uh, in addition to writing about themes that I think are Whitman approved, right? Whether that's Sanctuary Road or a nation of others, uh, if Whitman would have been around for Ellis Island, I, I think he would have, he would have loved something like that. But yeah. you've actually also set Whitman and other poets to music. So yeah. was that your choice or was that again, someone else, a librettist kind of approaching you with that poetry? Well, no, I mean, uh, the great thing, one of the great things about Whitman is, you know, when I think of Whitman, I think of his generosity, his spirit, you know, I, I think of his, um, He's he sings, his words sing. They give rise to song, um, and you know they're they're poems. But he was thinking lyrically. His his words are lyrics. That is, um, you look at a poem of his and he says, "I've got to set this." You know, it it, it causes me to sing somehow. I hear music when I read these words, and um, it's. it's full of music already to begin with, of course, that's the music of poetry, um, but um, it's almost irresistible. So yeah, I've set, I mean, I haven't counted up, but I've done at least a dozen settings of uh, of his poems, various poems somewhere, you know, <laughs> over, over my long career, so. And uh, yeah, I wanna play something from a new country in a second. So people have a, a chance to hear your incredible uh, work. But before we get there, I'm really interested in hearing music with Whitman because a lot of people say this. And yet, of course, we all know that, you know, he invented free verse. So there's no rhyming. There's, you know, sometimes there's kind of an internal rhythm or something that he's playing with, but it's not always there. Snow music to Whitman, right? Um, can you tell us, I mean, where do you, where do you recognize it? And maybe I, what I did is I put, uh, City of Ships up on my computer and maybe I'll bring that up right now because I was going to play um, the one that you set to that. I think you call it City of the World. Like you right. take lines from City of Ships and make it into that. But not yeah. everybody. Yeah. Go Sorry? Ahead. Go, ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, I, I think for a layman or layperson, looking at Whitman doesn't necessarily make us think of music just because it doesn't look orderly or like lyrics usually do somehow. Right. Um, so let me see, I'm gonna share my screen, Paul, actually. And I'm in danger when I do that of showing the entire world everything I do. So, so let me see if I can figure out how to share a portion of the screen. Can you guys see this? City yes. of Ships, is that? Yes. Okay, so I'm showing you all a page of drum taps, which is, Whitman's collection of poetry he came out with uh, just as the Civil War was ending in 1865. And he included this poem, even though he wrote it in New York in 1862. And it's very much about being in New York at the time that the Civil War was rising. And uh, do you wanna read it, Paul, or should I do it? Like either way is fine with me. Well, I what I'll do is I'll read um, the excerpt that I took out of this. Oh, great. Okay, so we can compare it. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, if I set the entire thing, 
uh, I wouldn't know how to do this because first of all, it's too long. Um, and what I did was to extract in this kind of, you know, I guess brutal way, <laughs> kind of extracted what's useful to me as a composer. So this is what I, this is, these are the words I set. Uh, city of the world, um, all races are here. Um, see, and, and then if you set all the lands of the earth make contributions here, it's too prosaic, right? Yeah. It goes on too long. So I don't need that. So I, I go right on and say, city of the sea, city of hurried and glittering tides, city whose uh, tides continually rush or recede, whirling in and out with eddies. Um, then I, I skip the wharves and the tall facades. Again, it's too prosaic, but I go to proud and passionate city, um, meddlesome, mad, extravagant city. Um, That's a great line. I agree about <laughs> setting that one. That's my favorite line of the poem. It's fantastic. You know, it's a it's a great lyric. So, you, you know, you can see what I've done here is I've, um, well, as, as I say, I've extracted what's useful to me as a composer and what I can do best, you know. And so that's that's what I did. Well, I guess what you're telling us is that Whitman is musical to a point. Exactly. Um, with yeah. some editing, Whitman yeah. is musical. So there's there's stuff to lift out of here. You know, I hate, I, I hate to say it as much as I admire Whitman. He needed an editor. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? Yes. Uh, but, he, does, he does go on <laughs> sometimes. And I actually purposefully gave you the first version of this poem because he worked as his own editor through his entire life. Right. Right. As you know, Paul, he had several editions of Leaves of Grass, depending on how you count them, anywhere from six to nine. Yes. And no, Paul, he was a fluxus artist, right? Like every time he changed the poetry. So he was always updating and always changing. Right. And later in his life, when he redid City of Ships, he left out a lot of that stuff that you left out, especially about the war, um, yeah. Yeah. because he's updating it, right? Like he wrote it in 1862 when the war was imminent in New York and he was reacting yeah. to that. But later, the most important part of it wasn't that, but actually the city of ships. Right. So, Interesting. I didn't know that. But, yeah. yeah. So, uh, and that's why you should work with me sometimes if you're setting Whitman, because well, <laughs> I can I, I, direct I, you I, to the right one. <laughs> I, I can credit you with bringing to my attention um, the poem about Ireland. Oh, well, I am which absolutely is, which, honored to have anything to do with your work, Paul. So it was my my pleasure to 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 recommend. But Old um, Ireland, it's, it's a fantastic poem, which I didn't know at all. And that you brought it to my attention. And it's part of a new country. In fact, that's how it ends with that poem setting. And that's why it's called a new country, because, you know, he uses that term in the in, in, in the poem. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, and uh, but just before I let this one go, um, it's really interesting to hear how you picked and chose from the lines in order to sort of lift out the musicality. In effect, as you said, editing Whitman, finding the best lines, the right. uh, most musical lines. And right. uh, he was often long-winded, right? He's he's yeah. going on and on here, especially about, about the war. Yeah. Um, I was just interested that you left the entire title out though, like the city of ships, was there that, because people have to really dig to find city of the world is actually city of ships. So it felt to me, were you purposely like placing your own mark on your adaptations of these poems? Yes, absolutely, yeah. Because <laughs> I mean, you do that, Right, with the other poems in that too. So I have um, no shame. <laughs> no, that and you are the one who is actually doing that. So you have every right to do it. It's public right. domain. I can do what I want. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at this point, it definitely is. So now I think I'm going to try to bring us to YouTube, where you have kindly posted a a, a performance of a new country. And let me know if I'm doing a good job here. Well, I can see it, yes. Okay, great. And I think, Paul, I'm going to just play City of Ships. 
sure. which, or city of the world, as you call it. So I'm going to eight minutes, 34 seconds. Here we go. Let me stop this and ask if you can hear it. Um, I can hear it, yes. Okay, um, Zelia, can you give me a thumbs up on that? Because I know sometimes when we play stuff, it not, is not necessarily heard and that this is the most important part of showing this. I'll look in the chat. Let me listen on YouTube. Okay, she's gonna take a listen. Here we go. I'm gonna just try a little piece, guys. <laughs> So beautiful, and I hate to stop it, but just making sure everyone can hear it. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to play this section. Thank you. in the morning. <laughs> it is absolutely magnificent, Paul. Um, and I think if Whitman could have heard it, he would have absolutely been so proud and approved. Um, I think even in the, the way that it's performed, um, uh, maybe it's just coincidental, but the way in which the, the violinists are moving and everyone, it reminds me of the city of ships, the water and the oh, energy yeah. of it is, is really up there. Can, can you tell us a little bit about that particular performance? Yeah, this is the Bridgehampton Chamber Music Festival, uh, which is the flutist is Maria Martin, um, who runs the festival um, and, the, and this all-star cast of, of instrumentalists there. Um, you can, uh, on YouTube, you can see their names, they're all there. Um, and the singer is Jennifer Johnson Cano, who is one of the great mezzos active today. She's absolutely fantastic, as you can hear. She's, you know, wonderful. Um, and they premiered the piece. That was the premiere, so. So the composition sounds to me as if it were a circular in a way, right? There's a feeling of a current or a tide. Is that purposeful? Yes, absolutely, yeah. I, it, it's, uh, yes. So what is that called again? Like a tone poem, right? Am I reaching yes. to the right thing? Yeah. Well, uh, you could call it text painting in a way. That is um, making the text audible, you know, uh, or, or, or illuminating it. 
um, you know, so it sounds like what it is. That's that's what that's the idea. I like that idea of text painting, although you're skipping the musical component when you say that. <laughs> Word painting. Yeah. <laughs> that's just that's the phrase that's used, you know, for a tone poem. Uh, it's, it's it's also known as programmatic music. That is, right. there's absolute music like a, a symphony or a sonata. That's absolute music because it's just about itself. It does, you know, it's not, but um, something like um, the tone poems of Richard Strauss, um, uh, you know, like also Sprach Zarathustra. You know, that's programmatic. I mean, he's he's really trying to musicalize a text and so on. That's very much a 19th century idea. Sorry. And that to me seems more intuitive when it comes to setting Whitman, because he is, as I like to call him, the poet of the body. <laughs> I know he declared himself the poet of the body and the poet of the soul, but I feel like for Whitman, the body often came first. Right. So there's something very physical and visceral about his work, right? It's, it's highly visual. Um, I, I think this is why, you know, he's he's aiming for a, a popular audience and and really trying to bring people into different experiences. So so this one, it, it works so well for me and I can see and understand better how one might set this. I guess for me, when I was at A Nation of Others and trying to wrap my head around this idea that you guys were delivering a concept, right? The, the greatness of human experience, that's where it's harder for me. That's, I guess, why I began the show by asking you those questions. Mm -hmm. uh, because whereas I could imagine being a composer trying to create the sound of something I can see, it seems to me harder to, to emotively de deliver a, a feeling or an idea. Yes, it's, um, and it's very much hit or miss. <laughs> well, um, you, you hit it. I, it's, it's absolutely yeah. gorgeous piece. How does it sound, how does it feel to hear people bring your own music to life I, I, it's a thrill i can't even describe i mean it's and i never get over it i never get over the the pleasure of hearing as we just heard you know spectacular excellent musicians realizing something that i imagined it, there's something s sort of magical about it and uh it's a great privilege you know it's a great honor uh for me to work with you know, great musicians. And, you know, I've, I've written about 200 pieces. I've heard most of them all, well, yeah, all of them performed. And the, and hearing a piece for the first time, I never get over the, the excitement of that. It's just so cool. You know, it's a great thing. Oh, that's, that's so lovely to hear. Have you ever written text? Um, I've adapted it, you know, and I've, you know, as we've talked about with the with the Whitman poems, for instance. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and by the way, what you heard in that excerpt, I stole some words from other of his I thought poems. so. I celebrate. Okay. Did you say I celebrate myself? Oh yeah. That comes from another poem, and I don't I don't know which one, but anyway. Wait, so. wait, you don't know where I celebrate myself comes from? No, no. The, the I didn't use that. Oh. Yeah, look at look at the text and you'll see that I've extracted. Right. Uh, lines from other <laughs> about immigrants and so on. That's it was I'm... right. I celebrate something else that I I I didn't hear the the object of that sentence. Yeah. Right. She does sing about celebration. So yeah. I just that's from, automatically that's, that's yeah. not from the city of ships. That's from another right. poem. So anyways, I'm merciless. <laughs> well, <laughs> actually, you know so in that sense, I'm I'm actually putting together. Uh, something that he didn't write, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm adapting it, you know, from his. Well, you're not the only one. And in fact, uh, if you listen uh, to my interview with Rob Patterson, uh, uh, who claims that he is setting six Whitman poems, and then when I really dug in with Rob, I was like, wait a second. Uh, uh, <laughs> These are not actually six Whitman poems. They're six adapted poems using Whitman's uh, lines. It, it's a poetic license. Um, <laughs> Absolutely allowed. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're working on now. I, I read something in your profile about The Shining with, with Mark. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I just happen to have the score here. Yeah. Here's The Shining. Oh, my gosh. It, it, are you, is it really the, the Kubrick film and the King novel? 
this is the Stephen King novel, yes, um, The Shining, yes, this, the very same. That premiered at Minnesota Opera in 2016. This is also with Mark Campbell, by the way, really a librettist. Um, and it's getting done all over. Uh, it, it's gonna be in, they just did it in Colorado, Opera Colorado just did The Shining. Of course, that's where The Shining takes place, so they were all excited about that. You know. right. uh, it's a Colorado story. Um, and it's coming to the Kansas City Opera, Lyric uh, Opera Kansas City is doing it in March. Big, and we're going to record it. It's going to be a big, huge thing. Yeah. Um, and then it will be in San Francisco in um, June. And then ne next season, it'll be at Atlanta Opera. So it's, go it's going around. It's, it's getting around. And, um, and um, what we did is we set um, the novel, the novel is much more operatic, by the way, than, yeah. than the film. The film is brilliant in its own way, but it's not really operatic. And um, th what makes this story, apart from, the, you know, the ghosts and the, <laughs> and the girls, you know, the go, you know, and the, um, is it, it's, it's about love, it's a love story. And, and the character, Jack Torrance, the, the central character, in the novel is really much more operatic than because uh, there's there's a real um, a, a trajectory going on. There's a, there's a dramatic arc going on in that story, which is absent from the film. So anyway, it, it's a long story, but anyways, I it, it's a it's a very operatic story because it's about love, death, and power, and it's got all these ghosts, and it's scary, and it's you know it's it's it's, it's like a beautiful nightmare the whole thing. So. So if I'm understanding your use of the word operatic correctly, uh, high drama is part of that. Absolutely. Got There's got to be a reason for people singing. Why are people singing? What gives rise to song? That's the number one question that every composer begins with. And The Shining has that on, in, you know, on steroids. <laughs> it's, wow. You know. Well, you know, I, I I must admit that I did not read the King novel, but for me, Jack Torrance is Jack Nicholson, and yeah. I have a really hard time imagining Jack Nicholson operatically delivering this story. <laughs> well, if, if I talk about the difference between the, the the Kubrick film, you know, there's Jack Nicholson, you know, and you, he always he's arching his eyebrows right from the beginning. So there's no story there. He, he, he's he's nuts already you know <laughs> what what makes it a great story is the transformation this kind of Jekyll and Hyde kind of transformation mm -hmm. that happens in the in the course of the story um and that's what that's the tragedy is that he's basically a decent guy trying to do the right thing and um you know and it's it's it's, it's a terribly tragic story but that's that's drama that's what makes it a great story Wow, that's fascinating. Congratulations. I'm dying to see it. Um, were you just following Mark's lead with the libretto? Or, I mean, because this feels to me like a diversion from your usual, more historical Americana. Well, if I might get back to A Nation of Others and, and you know, um, this is what Mark and I are doing is kind of reimagining the oratorio. Uh, as uh, 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 we're not documentarians, we're not historians. We're we're not, you know. If you want to make a a documentary, get you know hire Ken Burns to do it, and you know really you know do it, you know accurately and so on. We're not we're not doing that. We're it's poetic license, and we're imagining um, these things in this oratorio uh, framework. Um, and we and I call them uh, American historical oratorios. And we're, we're sort of inventing this genre. It's kind of a new okay. thing. I mean, people have sort of done it in, in some ways, but we're making a whole um, series of things. The first of them, by the way, is this, um, which I wrote before I started working with Mark, and it's called The Blizzard Voices. And mm. it's about the blizzard of 1888 in the Great Plains. Um, and that is... Um, Ted Couser, uh, the, the poet, adapted the words of survivors talking about the blizzard, you know, so it's very literally 
um, you know, historical. And I'm, I'm using their actual words in the, in, in the libretto. So that was the first of my, what I call American historical oratorios. Then William Still and the Underground Railroad and Sanctuary Road, That's, that was with Mark. A Nation of Others, which is about Ellis Island, 1921. And now, what we're working on now is an or, uh, our next oratorio about the history of voting rights and en enfranchisement, the sort of wow. wide, widening circle of enfranchisement in America historically. So we, we begin with Benjamin Franklin, for example, uh, and we come up to the present, you know, and um, we hear from historically significant um, figures uh, like Frederick Douglass and so on. Um, but again, our focus is on ordinary people <laughs> who are not, you know, historically, who, who, are, who would be known really only to their friends and, and family and so on. And uh, so it's a combination of those, those two things. And that's what we're working on now. So I, I love uh, uh, what I'm hearing is that you are really set on reinvigorating a genre that many people might consider more classical and traditional and yeah. bring a, a real American vision to these things, which is, you know, it's such a gift, Paul, because I guess, especially for me, after living in, in the UK for a year and really enjoying their pride in their history and, you know, what they've, they have such a tremendous appetite for their own culture, the English. Uh, and then coming back here and maybe feeling more the dearth of that, right? Like I'm an Americanist and I, I love working on it, but it's not like you can go out in New York and hear uh, an oratorio based on the Underground Railroad. I, I really love what you all are doing in terms of putting American stories at the fore of a really magnificent uh, re-envisioned re tradition. That That's great. And I think even more exciting for me is your emphasis on just the pop, the people, right? The, the human voices behind it. So this is not just like about glorifying one vision, not even Whitman, but, but really seeing how he even was aiming to, to bring those voices to light. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, now the shining fits in better for me because I guess you guys <laughs> are just really experimenting, right? Like just dabbling kind of, feeling out various different things, because that really is also a big American story. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> well, how could we keep track of you? I guess the, the your My website? website. Yeah, paulmorvec.com. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go soon because I have, I have a hard deadline here. So and I hear you coughing and I know you've been sick and we just so much appreciate you coming and doing the show with us. And uh, Paul, congratulations to you, to Mark, the, the whole chorus, everything magnificent. Everybody out there, thank you for your patience as we worked to, to make everything work. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Paul as I did and um, happy, happy holidays. We'll probably see you next year at Robust American Love. And thank you, Zelia, for for making us happen here. All right, Paul, thank you again. Thank you. Happy holidays, Goodbye. everyone. Take care. Happy holidays. Bye.